what do we, what's our mission? And we had to really think that through hard. And we're still working on it, but I think we've got something. And I don't want to bore you with anything long, but I think this is what, what we got. If I got, oh, no, it's not here. This is an older slide. Yeah, it's not on here, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll skip it. But basically, it's a statue of an old British uh, baron, I guess, with a wig, and it says, sue the bastard. is a Los Angeles attorney who practices civil litigation and appellate advocacy and has taken on high-profile cases involving paternity fraud and male victims of domestic violence. He formed the LA chapter of the National Coalition for Men and has served as its president. Gentlemen and ladies, Mark Angelucci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I start, there were a few things Harry uh, didn't get to say because um, he didn't finish the slides, and I'm not going to cover them all, but there's one thing he, he, he had asked me to mention briefly because it's important, and it has to do with our um, chapter in the Carolinas because that guy, Jeff, uh, um, Joseph, I'm sorry, Greg Joseph Chuck, has done so much work in the area of Title IX. He started a chapter of NCFM there, and he has done... So he's helped people file lawsuits against their universities. He's helped file numerous Title IX complaints. He has connected us with people, high-level people at the Department of Education. I have even, well, I don't want to go there, but we've had a tremendous impact. He even brought um, male, falsely accused men to meetings at the highest level of the Department of Education to facilitate the, some of the changes that have happened. And that's a very important part of um, the things that Harry was talking about with regard to NCFM. That's the one thing uh, he asked if I could mention just because he didn't get to. And I appreciate that. Sorry. Yeah, the one thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So thank you all very much for being here. Um, and thank you to all the people who organized this amazing event. I'm very, very thankful. I've been with NCFM, National Coalition for Men, since 1998 when I joined as a law student for numerous reasons that I'm not going to go into, but because um, the main thing I'm going to focus on sort of with Harry was sort of broadly about NCFM, and what I want to focus on is the legal aspect, in particular the legal team that we're putting together. And what I've decided, because I think it's really important, and what I've decided to do is take five cases. It's really hard to pick them because we've done so many. Ever since I joined, we've, been, we've helped numerous people in their cases, their family law cases, restraining orders, and other types of things. Um, but never as a law firm, never as National Coalition for Men Legal Center or anything like that, just sort of unofficially with me or others taking the cases. So I'm going to go over four, three or four cases first where we, where we weren't the law firm. One of them is the selective service case that a lot of you have asked about. I'm going to briefly go over those. And then the final one I'm going to talk more extensively about because it's very current. It's very intense. We're really excited about it. And things are just starting to turn. It's a false accusation case that shows a perfect example of how a false accusation, even without a conviction, snowballs and can destroy someone's life, business, and everything else and drive them to suicide or other types of things. And we are now turning that case from the defensive to the offensive. And so I'll end on that. But first I'm going to go over four cases kind of briefly so that I don't go over my time. Hey you! Yes you! Watching this video. Did you miss out on going to the International Conference on Men's Issues? Or did you go and now you miss the fun times you had at this amazing event? Experience the magic of ICMI 2019 again, or for the very first time, with Honey Badger Radio's ICMI Disc Set. The Disc Set brings ICMI presentations together in one convenient package, as well as Disc Set exclusive Badger bonus content. 
Enjoy behind-the-scenes Badger interviews with free speech and men's issues luminaries like Sargon, Janice Fiamengo, and Count Dankula, as well as a never-before-seen Badger cartoon. Also available is sparkling ICMI merch, such as our professionally designed program book, sticker sets, badges, and more. Go to feedthebadger.com and claim a piece of men's rights history for yourself. Um, oh, here, here's the office. I know Harry talked about that. Uh, that's just me. Um, going back a minute. Um, Ever since I joined NCFM, I've, I've always kind of wanted to have a legal team. I was a philosophy major at UC Berkeley, and I loved philosophy, but after three years of that, I got sick of the talking, 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 talking. And uh, The one thing in philosophy we loved, though, was when you have a mental breakthrough. You've been working on something so hard, and you break through, and you get it, and you call your friend at 2 in the morning and say, I got it. Right? Well, in the law at least in the kind of work I'm doing with men's rights, that the, the times that I'm most happy are when I get to call my client and say, we won. And that's usually with appeals, which is what I love the most. I practice family law. I teach family law. I practice some other areas, but I love nothing more than appeals. And that's what I want NCFM's legal team to focus on. Even though we can do restraining orders, family law, custody, all kinds of things, Civil rights lawsuits. I'm going to cover examples right now. But I love challenging judges' decisions. So we had to kind of think about what do we call, what's our, our mission statement if we're going to have a legal team. We've got a group of attorneys right now, all volunteers. We've got paralegals, as Harry said. We've got uh, investigators. What do we, what's our mission? And we had to really think that through hard. And we're still working on it, but... I think we've got something, and I don't want to bore you with anything long, but I think this is what, what we got. If I got, oh, no, it's not here. This is an older slide. Yeah, it's not on here, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll skip it, but basically it's a statue of an old British uh, baron, I guess, with a wig, and it says, sue the bastards. And I, I bought that. Two, 20 years ago at a swap meet, not thinking much of it, and now I absolutely love that thing, that little guy. i got to give him a name, but when we start our office, that's going to sit right on my desk because I believe we need to hold people accountable for false accusations and not just talk about it. Okay? We need, thank you. Yes, we can talk about it and talk about it, but we also need to sue them, and we need to sue the counties and the agencies that back them up and support these kind of things. We need to take action in every way we can. So, um, some of these are, yeah, this is an older slide, set of slides, so some of these pictures of these people I'm not going to have, and I'm sorry, but that's, that's my fault. The first case I got for NCFM was out of law school in about 2002. David... Gunther. I have a picture of him and I, but it's not here. David Gunther was in the Fresno area. I'm in L.A. And I didn't know what I was doing, but through the men's rights circles, he got to us. And he said, look, I've, I'm disabled. And he was. He had had a bad motorcycle accident. He'd had all his teeth knocked out, skin grafts, everything, PTSD. He had a child. It was his child. And he had been paying support until he had this accident and became disabled. And then Mom, he couldn't find the child. He wasn't paying for a while. The DA decided, and this was when the DA controlled child support, we're going to go after him in some way. They found out he got married to a woman who had an income. And so they decided, well, there's a law in California that was actually put on there by a group called the Second Wives Club decades ago, kind of a friend of the Father's Rights Movement, that says you can't use your, a person's new spouse's income to calculate how much child support they owe. And that would be true for both the recipient and for the payer. So it works both ways. If I owe support, I get married to someone who makes a lot of money. They can't add that person's income to my income to raise the amount I owe. Likewise, if I'm a recipient and I marry somebody. With the exception of a case that is extraordinary where without using that income, there would be severe 
an extreme hardship on the child. That's the exception. Like all laws have, they have exceptions. Well, this district attorney decided we're going to go after this guy and raise the, his support amount because he married this woman who has income. And this was in Fresno, one of these little courts that's like a little fiefdom, right, where the DAs know the judge. You can see it. The judge always goes with the DA. So he had like a four-day trial, and he had to drive up. His wife had to drive him up to Fresno every time. He's disabled. He's suffering from – he had an attorney. And what did they do? They, they showed a letter from his doctor that said, you need to lose weight because it's hurting your back. You need to go to a gym and swim a little bit to lose weight to relieve your pain. But it didn't say that he needed to do that to retrain for work. But what did the DA do? Present that to the judge and then in closing argument say, he's not going to a gym every day. He's not retraining for work. So he's just, you know, he's faking all this stuff, that kind of thing. So. Things like that they did to him. And what were the hardships on the child? Well, she needed um, glasses, and she had asthma, so she needed an inhaler. Extreme and severe hardship. Yeah, the judge said yes. And added his wife's income, and suddenly his support amount went from 200 a month to nearly 1000 a month. Going back retroactive a year, because this trial took a year of him having to come up, and it gets continued. Now his arrears go from, from about 5000 to about twenty-five or 30000 And now he's frightened to death. And he talks to his attorney, and she tells him, you're not going to win on an appeal. And, and if you want me to do it, it's, I don't remember what she said, like ten or $15,000, which he didn't have. And he was so frightened, he became suicidal. And every, le- every, every notice he got in the, in the mail spelled jail to him. Well, he found us. And it came to me, and I didn't, I'd never done an appeal. I didn't know what I was doing. I was working for a nonprofit that helped people with mental disabilities for free. So I had to do all this on the side. And I got a little bit of help, and I mustered up the courage to do it, um, to do the appeal. I got as m- much help as I could from appellate attorneys, but not very many really were stepping up. And ultimately, after over a year, I had the wonderful pleasure of calling him and saying, we won. They, they reversed the decision in a very scathing decision, chastising that court for what they did, for abusing the law in the ways that they did. I wish I could go into it more. It's mandatory reading for my family law class. Um, but in any event, he was, and while the case was pending, he hung himself in the basement. He was so, he was, he was so frightened because he, well, he lived, I'm sorry. He, <laughs> I gotta say these things because you're wondering. He he hung himself partly because not even so much the fear of jail, but the effect it was having on his marriage, and that's why these things are so destruct. These kind of cases are so destructive because his wife was was it was affecting her finances. She had kids of her own in Canada. She had to support, and it was creating tensions. But when I told him that, he called his wife right away at work and his, said, we won the appeal, and his wife screamed at work. That's how excited they were. And to this day, he lives now in Eugene, Oregon, and he thanks me to this day. He tells me without us, he, he'd be dead. He lived when he hung himself. Um, his wife found him in the basement. The ambulance came, resuscitated him and all that. And he didn't try it again, and now he's alive and well. They, his arrears went back down to like 5000 and then we, we cut a deal to make it like three, and that was it, and it was over. But we gave them hell, and we know that that judge knew these DAs. At one point, to be quick, after, in some of the post-appeal it, things, when I was appearing, immediately one time when the judge stepped off the bench, the DA went up and whispered in the judge's ear. And I said, is this ex party? What is this? And they both turned around simultaneously and said, no, this is personal. And it turned out something had happened to the DA's dog at home, and she had to go home. And I'm thinking, if something happens to my dog, Your Honor, can I go up and whisper in your ear? And I don't have a lot of regrets, but that's one thing I wish I had said. Because since, since that time, I've, said, I've confronted judges much more harshly and gotten away with it. So I should have said that, but I didn't. I was new. 
After that, I don't know how many years later, another case came along. We've got many, many of them. But David Woods, a lot of you I'm sure heard of Woods versus Horton. Um, David Woods was a guy also in, Sacra- in the Sacramento area whose wife was violent to him. He was a really tough guy, a former bouncer from Houston. Um, but he never would hit her. He knew what would happen if he did. And his, she was just always slapping him, hitting him. One day, his daughter and him tried to find him a shelter at the local shelter, and they said, no, we don't help men. So he came to us, again, through different channels, and we eventually took him and said, we need to file a lawsuit. And we took him and three other male victims, one of them was Ray Bloomhorse, you saw his picture, um, from different parts of California. One was in a wheelchair. One of them successfully, I shouldn't say successfully, but did commit suicide while this case was pending on appeal. He did die. He's from Grass Valley, the poor guy. But we still had three of them left. And we sued the state of California, including some shelters that were state-funded, because that's the key. If they get state funds, they're not supposed to be discriminating. I don't care if they're private. That's fine. But they get state funds, which men pay at least half of. I say at least to be nice here. But they do. And there's no reason why they should be flat out denying any services to men. Even, I don't mean even mean just housing. I mean they were refusing to give hotel vouchers, legal advice, psychological counseling, things like that, just flat out. Um, so we sued. The lower court judge said, well, we sued in California under the California Constitution. We have our own equal protection clause. And the lower court judge said, look, I've seen battered men in my court, but um, I, can't, I, can't do, I can't do this because if I found this unconstitutional, I would have to eradicate the entire funding of 25-something million dollars a year that goes to all these shelters, which he was wrong about because there's something called judicial reformation, which means if you find something unconstitutional, but you think the legislative intent would have been to just reform it, to make it constitutional, instead of invalidating it, you can do that. And I showed him all the legislative history showing why he could do it, and he didn't listen at all. He just denied it. So we appealed that. And that whole thing took about, the whole thing took a total of four or five years. And I'll never forget, I mean, how intense that was on my mind. When I was waiting for that decision to come out, I I remember when I was going to fly somewhere, I gave my just a skeletal opening brief that would just barely work to my friend and attorney said, if my plane crashes, if my plane crashes, I want you to file this for me because I know no one else will. And I know if the plane shakes, I'll at least know that someone's going to do that. I'm serious. It was my baby. Um, And ultimately, I argued in front of three judges. And long story short, we won unanimously. They reversed it. Woods versus Horton, they said, it is unconstitutional to, disc- to discriminate against male victims if you get state funds. And this guy, this, the imp- it's a California decision. It went all, we had media all over the world. I had calls from Scotland. I got them from Canada. I think the island of Malta. Everywhere. Um, people, emails were just pouring in thanking me for, for taking this case. Um, but it's not over. We know, and there were some big changes, but we know that a lot of counties in California are, are passively resisting this and are still discriminating and are interpreting that, that case to mean as long as we send them to a place that does take men, even if it's hours away out in the desert, Valley Oasis, then we've complied, we've helped them. We, we're seeing this here and there, especially L.A. County. So we're going to do another, well, we're planning a Woods 2, okay, that's in the works. It's in the works. Um, Thank you. But we're really busy. I mean, it's hard. We're all volunteers. I, I have my own caseload. I have to make a living. Everyone else is volunteers. And so it's, as Harry said, and he answers at least 20 or so emails, calls, and pieces of mail a day for NCFM. And that's heroic. And that's the kind of thing that's unseen and unthanked. But without that, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing, among many other things that he does. So we have this team of volunteers, and he has to filter 
a lot of these cases because we just can't take even most of them. We only can take a few unless we can get the funding and get ourselves established, which we're going to do. I don't care how long it takes, we're going to do it. Um, the case of um, Marcos Valdez, this was our first case where NCFM was actually the law firm representing somebody. This guy in sort of the East L.A. area contacted us. Harry answered it. He said, you know, he's a victim of paternity fraud, basically. That's the story. And back in 2000, from 2002 to 2005, the L.A. chapter of NCFM did tons of work on paternity fraud. Not a lot of people know about it. But we wound up coming across some paternity fraud victims, and we didn't even know what it meant that, until we met them. And we learned. And we wound up going to Sacramento. There was a legislator up there, a, a moderate Democrat, who worked with us and drafted the legislation. He represented South Central L.A. So he had hundreds and hundreds of guys, mostly black men, who were affected by, who were victims of paternity fraud, being forced to pay for, for children that are not theirs, even when they had DNA to prove that this was not their child. The laws had not caught up, caught up with DNA yet at the time. And this was, a, it was horrible. We had so many of these guys coming to us. We, we raised just enough money to get that legislation introduced. We were bringing people up there to Sacramento to testify. One time we had over 100 people up there testifying. And it was a big fight because feminist lobby groups went against us. They did. They won't, they won't admit that, but they did. The, the California Now and others, I don't mind naming them. They fought us tooth and nail. We ultimately, after about a two- or three-year fight, got a compromise bill that extended the time for men from a six-month default rule to about two years to challenge uh, paternity by DNA. We would have liked longer, but we wouldn't have won. We were outgunned, outfunded, outlobbied. They had like 12 full-time lobby groups up there, and we had volunteers. So, but we did get that, and we got thousands and thousands and thousands of men throughout California off the hook who we were able to... Um, get, you know, through through this new legislation. So, action. Thank you. Action matters. Since that time, we, we, we also represented a number of fraternity fraud victims in, in cases, some of them high profile. Not long ago, a few years ago, this guy came to us, Marcos Valdez. And he said, look, I, I'm stuck in this situation. Harry sent it to me, and I thought, I mean, look, this one, I have to take this. I had to. And it was a perfect case for our first, law, our first case. He, about 20 years ago, he had a girlfriend who had a baby who said, this is your child. And he believed her. They broke up, but he continued kind of seeing the child a little for about a year and was paying his support. She got the county to collect child support against him, and he was paying it. About a year later, he got a DNA test on his own, and it was negative. So he went and showed it to her, said, look. And she got mad at him at first, at first, and then said, all right, all right, child's not yours. I'm going to tell DCSS, the county, to stop collecting. And she did. She told him, stop, this is not, he's not the dad. You need to stop collecting. And they told her, okay. We can stop collecting, but we're not the court. There's still an order in place, and the arrears are still going to accrue unless you or him go file a motion to overturn, to challenge paternity. And remember, they had two years to do this. So this is one year when the child's won. They had another year to do this. And all she would tell him is, don't worry, I'm taking care of it. Don't worry. Yeah, you can see where this is going, right? Don't worry. You don't have to pay anything. I'm taking care of it. And she may have been sincere. It's very weird because for years, every few years, the record shows she would call them again and say, why is his name still on there? Once she said, I, 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 I found the real dad. Um, it's my husband, and he wants to adopt the child. They would say the same thing. But she never, you know, the two years went by. Fifteen years later, here he is now with his wife and real kids, and she changes her mind. Fifteen years later, she wants all those arrears. 
$85,000 in arrears had accrued for this child who she admitted was not his. And she goes to the county and says, look, I want that money. And they say, okay. So they file their motion. We call it now an OS or um, RFO. They go to court. He hires an attorney, but he doesn't make a lot of money. It was really hard for him to pay that attorney. It wasn't us. Uh, his attorney, I don't think, was that great. But they showed up, and, and the judge kept saying, look, you had to challenge this 15 year, 13 years ago. You had two years. It's too late. That DNA test you got was not official with the, with the, approved by the court, and you had to file a motion. You haven't done it. So it's too bad. And they kept arguing and arguing until he stepped up and spoke over his attorney and said, but they haven't been collecting. And the judge is still talking and then stops and goes, wait a minute, what? They haven't been collecting. She turns to the DCSS. I read the whole transcript. I had to do the appeal. And says, is that true? And then the county attorney who had been quiet the whole time says, yeah, we haven't been. Well, why not? Well, 15 years ago, she told us he's not the dad, and she told us to stop. And she says, no, I didn't. I, she says, that was a, I thought that was a different case. She had other kids. Someone, you know. I was talking about a different case when that happened. This judge said, all right. I'm really summarizing this because there were numerous hearings. This judge says, all right, I'm done with this. I'm setting another hearing. DCSS, you need to submit to me all the records of all the communications that took place in this case. I want to see what happened. So they did, and she read it, and she saw repeatedly mom was telling them, he's not the dad, Colin, he's not the dad, take him off, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the judge ultimately does the right thing and says, look, nobody overturned this order, so the child's 17 and a half, you need to pay support from, from until the child's 18, ongoing, but I'm not going to enforce this $85,000 of arrears. Now, the case law is... There's no case law directly on point on this. And this is where it was a really interesting case. What the case law says, at least in California, is judges can refuse to enforce arrears if there's active concealment all the way until the child is 18, meaning the, the recipient parent conceals the child on purpose from the other parent and they can't find the child, and it's really supposed to be till the child's 18. Then a court can refuse to enforce arrears. But, there, but that's inequity, what we call equity, those of you who know what I'm talking about. The old English common law, the old English had an equity court and a law court. The, uh, you, if you didn't win in the court of law, which was strict, you could go to the court of equity, and it was more about fairness. In our courts now, they're combined in the same court. So she used that equitable principle to refuse to enforce arrears, and immediately mom appealed. And then his attorney said, look, just like with David Gunther, it's going to be ten or $15,000. He couldn't afford that, and he was scared. So he came directly to NCFM. Harry gave it to me, and I thought, That's, I've got to take this one. I don't care how much work it is. It's everything I love to do. It's appeals. It's paternity fraud. Not that I love paternity fraud. I love to fight paternity fraud. Um, and it's helping someone who can't afford it, which is what I want NCFM's legal team to do to do ultimately. So I took it on. Um, it was a lot of work. I even worked on it from Hawaii on vacation. I didn't mind. I'm sitting there with, overlooking the ocean in my room working on something I love to do. And I had the pleasure of calling him to saying, when it came out, we won. Hard-hitting decision saying, mom lied to the court saying that she didn't say that when she did. Mom has unclean hands the equitable principle of unclean hands. And she cannot ask for something if, if, if she has unclean hands. They can use that against you in equity. It's called equitable estoppel. You, when your own actions do something that prevent you from asking for certain kind of relief. Her actions of telling him, you don't have to pay, I'll take care of it, for all that time, and then lying to the court, stopped her from collecting that 85000 It was a decision I was very happy about, and thank you. And he sent us this picture, gave us permission to use it, and wrote us a really sweet, thankful letter. Very, very thankful, because we didn't charge him a cent. We even paid his, 
his uh, filing fees and everything. That's what we do. Um, so I'm just, one day I'm going to meet him. I haven't yet. He's in San Diego. We got to meet him one day. That's the kind of thing I want to do with NCFM. That's my vision. That's Harry's vision, too. And we're working towards that. That was our first big win. Another one I'm sure some of you have heard, which we're still working on, is the selective service case. Um, we first filed that about, I guess it was about six years ago when, when the, the, the Department of Defense said, we're going to allow women in all combat roles. Now, up until then, they had been increasingly women in, allowing women in certain roles. And then finally, they just said, boom, we're going to allow them in all roles. And that's when we decided we need to sue. Because there was an old decision, Roster versus Goldberg, I'm sure a lot of you know it, from 1981, where four guys sued the Selective Service and in the, and for discrimination under the Equal Protection Clause for forcing only men to register. And it went all, the lower court sided with the men. And so did the Federal Court of Appeal. But it was in the Supreme Court where there was a very sharply divided decision. Five judges against four, I believe that's what it was, who ruled against these men. And I, don't, I have to say that it wasn't totally irrational a decision because back then women weren't allowed in combat. So the reasoning was, look, I'm not saying I agree with it. In fact, there was a vigorous dissent from Justice Thurgood Marshall. But at least it had a, an element of rationality to it because their argument was, look, if the draft is only about combat, which it does not have to be, in World War II, we almost drafted women as nurses. In any event, that was their position. Women aren't allowed in combat, so why should they be required to register? They aren't similarly situated, and therefore we don't even go through equal protection analysis. That was the 1981 ruling. Well, now that's all changed, right? So we jumped on it. And without NCFM, just like all these other cases, we couldn't have done that. I couldn't have done it. NCFM provided the plaintiffs. We had to have draft age young men, whether they registered or not, who are willing to put their name out there and sue. And we, f we got them. And they had to be NCFM members because we wanted NCFM as the primary plaintiff. We want to send a message that there is an organization behind this. So it's National Coalition for Men versus Selective Service. We first filed it in LA. Immediately was thrown out. Immediately on a motion to dismiss, the judge was very hostile to us, didn't like us. It was obvious in her tone. Um, and said this, this case is not ripe because we don't know yet whether women really will be in all combat roles, even though the, the government has announced it will allow them all com in all combat roles. It was ridiculous. We appealed it, and unfortunately in federal court, appeals can take a really long time unless they're criminal. So it took over two years, but we won. We did an oral argument in front of three judges, and they reversed it went back to the lower court, they said, this is, this is ripe, went back to the lower court, and then that judge, again, still angry, transferred it to Houston. And that was for jurisdictional reasons that are complicated, it had to do with where our plaintiffs lived and all that. So in Houston, the Selective Service again tried to get it thrown out on grounds other than ripeness. Ripeness means, is it, is, is it a premature lawsuit? Do you have to wait until more things happen? Well, they challenged it now on standing and other kinds of things. One of the arguments was, these guys have already registered, so what difference would it make if we change this law? It's not going to affect them at all. Well, that's nonsense, right? I mean, first of all, it's discriminatory. Would you say that if they only required um, blacks or Jews or someone to register? Would you say that? Well, so what? It wouldn't, you know. But it's, it's ridiculous also because we're not taking a position on whether there should or shouldn't be a draft nor do we take a position as to whether women should be in combat. We are challenging strictly the sex discrimination. And I've had to repeat that in the media numerous times to make that clear. Because even among us, we have differences of opinion, of opinion about that. But that's the one thing most of us agree on, and the, and the sex discrimination, which really, in our opinion, ties to male disposability and sends a message that men are disposable. So. It's in Houston, and the, 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 fe the selective service, we were a little nervous out there, very conservative judges and all that. Maybe that's what this judge in L.A. thought was going to happen, but the opposite happened. This judge was really professional and listened to both sides and wrote excellent orders and denied all of their efforts to throw, us, to throw our case out. And then we filed a motion for summary judgment, 
and he granted it. He granted it as a declaratory relief. So he didn't grant an injunction, and I think it's because he thinks the government may still need more time because they're deliberating this stuff in Congress, right, which they've been doing for decades, and even the judge said that. But he made a declaratory judgment that this is unconstitutional to force only men to register. And it got, that, again, got all over the media for three days. Harry and I were answering calls. It was insane. I, I had very little sleep. Okay. Now that Selective Service has appealed it, and they just filed their opening brief. I've got 10 minutes, and I've got to talk about Jerry Cox. I'm sorry. Jerry Cox, this guy, the most exciting case right now that we're handling. That's Jerry. That's Imran, one of our attorneys. He got screwed, too. He is an attorney. He had a relationship with an attorney. She was violent to him three times, and she admits it. He was violent once, and what did they do? The state bar went after him only, not her. And they wanted to, and actually, there was a feminist judge. I cross-examined a feminist expert, so-called, and the feminist judge who said, when I asked the expert, Are you, do you consider yourself a feminist? The judge blurted out, I'm a feminist. I just want that on record, something like that. She decided to disbar him completely, okay, completely. And it had never been, it was unprecedented. In the past, domestic violence attorneys would get maybe six months suspension. They wanted to make an example of him, but they didn't touch his girlfriend. And there was no dispute that she was violent to him three times. She admitted it on the stand. So he, we, we helped him out, too, voluntarily, and he appealed it, and he won. They reversed it. He's two-year suspension. Most of it is time already done, so it's got maybe six months or a year left. And now I'm planning to sue the state bar. Fuck them for that. I'm sorry. That is bullshit. That is bullshit. I'm sorry for cussing. Thank you. There's no kids in here, right? I'm sorry about that. But that pisses me off. The state bar. How can they explain that, right? Anyway, this is Jerry. He came to us, too. He's a rancher. He owns a 500-acre ranch in Mariposa, which is out near Yosemite. He uses that ranch. I'm really going to try and be brief. He uses that ranch for agritourism. People stay on the ranch. They pay him for a one. It's called Bison Creek Ranch. He had all these bison. Great guy. We really got to know him. He had this girlfriend who'd come on the ranch every now and then, and all of a sudden they had a little argument. Long story short, she went to the sheriff and said, and, and she has a history. We found this. We found out she has a history. She collects money from the victim compensation. She said to the sheriffs, he locked her up on his ranch for three days in a room and raped her and sodomized her and all these things. And I, I can't go into all the details here, but it was absolutely false, and I'll get to, to that as to, to the evidence of that. But immediately, they arrest him. The first officer who shows up is CHP. And the cop looks... First of all, they never even took her cell phone. But the, the CHP officer takes her cell phone and says, I see all these texts during those three days. You guys look kind of cozy. You're saying you were locked up? And then the, other, the, the, the sheriffs come instead, so it's their jurisdiction. CHP guy steps down. The sheriffs step in, much more political. They didn't take the cell phone. They didn't do any forensic downloads of his phone or hers for a long time. They arrested him immediately charged him with numerous felonies, I don't know how many. Then they raided his ranch, and they used a search warrant that is under seal. We're going to get that unsealed. We believe they used the criminal evidence to do a civil search. We're not sure yet, but they concocted all these violations, safety violations. Many of them were complete BS, and we can prove it. Some of them were just exaggerated. Some of them were very minor but absolutely, a very professional county person who knows how to do this did it. And they railroaded him in court got, without even giving an injunction to see if he would first comply with it. The receive, they kicked him off his ranch, put a receiver on the ranch, put armed guards all over the ranch, start racking up the fees of those guards and all their legal fees, and he's all over the media, rapist. You know, rape, Jared Cox, this, that, and that. Okay, and now his business is destroyed. He has to sell his bison to pay his attorney and that kind of thing. He can't operate the ranch. He comes to us. He did have a really good defense attorney who worked with us. 
Eventually, that defense attorney got hold of a deposition that this false accuser, um, what she had a workers' compensation case in which she was claiming she was injured from work, and they did, took her deposition, and they asked, have you been raped or anything? Yeah, way back then, my uncle or something. Uh, anything since then? Not that I recall. On record, right? She didn't think that we'd be able to get hold of that, but we did. And when we got that, first of all, he's already kicked off his ranch with a receiver, and this receiver has racked up like over $500,000 of fees that they're going to make him pay. And um, not only that, but, okay, so, so eventually they dismissed the criminal case, but not, it was almost two years. They sat on it on purpose so that they can do this receivership. It's a land grab, and we believe there's corruption. It's a small courthouse with three judges. These are the people who sit at lunch every day together. They know each other. Anyway, we stepped in, and I've been representing him in the receivership case, and now they're trying to sell his property just to pay and, and the receiver told the judge, it's going to cost hundreds of thousands to pay for these repairs. Well, the receiver never got estimates like he was supposed to. So Jerry got estimates, $8,000, another one, 13000 That's all it took. He paid it all, fixed it all. Now they're going after him trying to sell his property to pay the receiver all those fees, right? The guards and all that stuff. And so they're saying, well, we're going to have to sell your property. He's on food stamps now, okay? We're lucky he's alive, we're lucky he's calm. We're lucky he hasn't killed himself or gone crazy and killed someone else. We're taking the receivership case, and I represented him in the restraining order case that we sued the false accuser. Another thing, we sued her. And that's still pending, but as soon as we served her, she came rushing in to try and renew a protective order that was issued against him three years ago, saying, telling the judge he raped me and all this. So I took that one on, too. It was starting to get a little burdensome, but I took that on, and that trial was on July 26th, and we tore them apart. We tore, it was an all-day trial in San Luis Obispo, where the false accuser lives, three hours from Mariposa, and after, I mean, long story short, we won, and the judge saw right through the lies. The judge saw that the, the, she, her testimony cannot hold water. She put some really good language in the transcript, and we are now using that to turn the tides, to turn it completely not only suing her, but suing the county, suing the sheriff who didn't gather all that evidence, and others. About three minutes. We just, this is the news, front page. Oh, no, that's not even it. Front page, this is us right after we won. We were so excited. I celebrated like crazy. That's Jerry. Thank you. His current girlfriend. His helpers on the ranch, who've now moved to other states, they flew in as witnesses because they were there when all this happened. They were there, and I could go, I could spend an hour talking about all this. But uh, the local news has been very good to us, very supportive. In fact, the local editor has been in spats with the county supervisors over this and other things, and we think there's corruption. So they've been covering us really good, well, and there's a front page story a few days ago. First thing says, attorney says lawsuits coming against the county of Mariposa, in really big words. And then it shows pictures of us, of me, of the judge, of the receiver, of Jerry, you know, little pictures. And then it talks about the case in San Luis where we won, and it describes the testimony. So we've even had people at the courthouse with signs. We're raising awareness. We're fighting to keep his property. They're trying to sell it right now. There's another hearing coming up in two weeks. This is an ongoing thing. But just Friday, a few days ago, what was that, yesterday? Yesterday. Well, am I right, Harry? We filed, we teamed up with a local civil rights firm, and we filed a federal 1983 lawsuit, Section 1983 Civil Rights Act, against the county, the sheriffs, and others, others. They haven't been served yet, so I'm not going to say anything because I don't want, you know. But, uh, and, and, and we're on it. And I'm, I am, we are all super excited about this one because now we're turning the tides. We're holding people accountable. No matter what happens, we're not going to stop. I wish I had the time to give you all the details of this case. But this is the kind of thing we want to do. And this is the kind of thing we're going to do, whether we're volunteers or whether we're well-funded. Well we're going to get those funds one day, and we can do it statewide and even nationwide. But for now, we're as volunteers, and we will not stop 
that's it. I have one minute. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very, very much. I mean it for being here. All of you. I, I'm always saying, you know, people like me get thanked a lot, but there are so many who don't and remember them too. And administrators, people who like Harry who answer calls all day long, people who do all kinds of stuff that don't get thanked. We, we need to thank everybody, and I'm thanking all of you just for being here. For being here alone, you're an activist. And someone said that makes you a terrorist. Well... <laughs> Still be it, if that's what it takes to fight back against what they're doing. They're going to quote you. Don't do that. <laughs> You're right. That's not how I meant it. Thank you. Can we reverse that and when I cuss to the other one? Back.